I enjoyed the announcements already made to express my personal appreciation for your presence tonight. I'm glad to be with you. As was announced last night, I'm talking to you tonight about why sin for Peter. Why sin for Peter? As a basis for this study, I'm reading from the book of Acts in chapter 10, began with verse 1. Acts 10, 1 began. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian man, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was affright, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up, for a memorial before God. <coughs> now verse 5 is a kicker. And now send men to Joppa and call one for Simon, whose surname is Peter. My question is for us tonight is, why send for Peter? In view of a lot of things that people teach today, there's no need to send for Peter. First of all, if an individual is saved by just being good, no need to send for Peter. I just read that here's a good man. You see those traits from Acts 10 2? He was devout, feared God. Not only that, but all his house did. He was benevolent, gave much alms to the people, and he prayed. Most people would conclude that he's a good man, right? Now, if just being good will save a fella, why send for Peter? You see the point? And throughout the study, I'm going to keep asking that question. I wish I could tell you tonight that you can be saved on the basis of your morality, that that's all it takes. Just be good. Now, I'm not downplaying being good. It's important. Jesus went about doing good, Acts 10 says. But we have to be better than just being good. But again, if angels preach to men, I sent for Peter. He saw in a vision in 10.3, about the nine hour of the day, three in the afternoon, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, you know, there are some people today who have the idea that angels talk to them. If that happens, why send for Peter? Angels don't preach to men. Paul writes the Galatians said, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which is preached, let it be accursed. Galatians 1, verse 8, and repeated that in verse 9. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. In the book of Romans chapter 10, 13, 14, 15, he said, how can they hear without a preacher? So there has to be preaching. Every case of conversion in the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 2 through 19, involve hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing God's word. So if angels preach to men, no need to bother Peter, right? No need to send for him. But also, if we are saved by having some kind of a vision, and there are those who think, think that, and no need to send for Peter, in Acts 10, 3, he saw in a vision Now, if we're saved by that process, why send for Peter? Don't need him. You see that? We're not saved by some vision. We're saved by hearing, believing, and obeying the Word of God. We need to learn that, and to learn that well. Likewise, you know, sometimes we're told that people are saved today by a direct operation 
of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit told Peter to go with the men in Acts 10, 19, 21. There is no scriptural evidence that the Holy Spirit does anything, does anything in converting men apart from the teaching of the Word of God. Do you know of anything that the Holy Spirit does apart from this Word? I don't. Maybe you do. But see, if, if we're saved by the Holy Spirit apart from hearing the Word and believing it, no need to send for Peter. For you remember there are three miracles connected with the conversion of Cornelius. I'm not saved but miraculous activity. First, he had that vision, and all that vision did in Acts 10, 1 through 5, was to get Peter and Cornelius together. That's all they did. The second miracle was when Peter was on the housetop praying, Acts 10, verse 9. A sheet-like thing was let down in front of him with all kind of beasts and wild things and creeping things and fowls of the air, Acts 10, 10, 11, 12. And a voice said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. He said, uh, I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Those are key words. You ought to underscore those in your Bible. You see, the Jews looked upon Gentiles as being common or unclean. What was the purpose of this miracle? One reason. In verse 28, he said unto them, You know that it's unlawful for a man that's a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. Now watch this little statement. But God showed me, what did he show Cornelius or Peter? That I should not call any man common or unclean. That was the only reason that that miraculous activity took the letting down that sheet-like thing. That's all it did. Had nothing to do with saving Cornelius. So if miracles save people, no need to send for, for Peter. That's already happened. You see that? All right. Now, the third miracle that took place in this conversion was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are two cases of Holy Spirit baptism in the Bible. One of them is in Acts chapter 2 that we study Sunday morning on the apostles. The second one is with Cornelius in Acts 10 and verse 11. In the book of Acts in chapter 10, verse 44, while Peter yet spoke these words or spake these words, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, they're the same, fell on all them which heard the word. Now when did the Holy Spirit fall on Cornelius? If you look in Acts eleven fifteen, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us, that is the apostles, at the beginning. And that beginning is in Acts chapter 2. There are many Bible beginnings. Makes a good sermon. Bible beginnings, doesn't it? Now, when you read the conversion of Cornelius, you've got to read chapter 10 and 11. The reason for that is, chapter 10 does not have it in chronological order. Just random. But when you come into chapter 11 of the book of Acts, verse 4 says, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expanded it by order unto them, saying, And so there's order to this conversion. And if you don't read both chapters, you miss the order into which that took place. Now, question. Why did the Holy Spirit fall on Cornelius? One reason. One reason. It's not to save him. The reason for it is, if you read in Acts 11 and verse 15 beginning, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us, that is the apostles, at the beginning. 
Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's a quotation from Matthew chapter 3. Now watch verse 17 and 18. For as much then as God gave them, that is the Gentiles, the like gift as he did unto us, the apostles, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you must believe on Christ to be saved, right? What was I that I should withstand God? Now the kicker is in verse 18. See, the apostles were fussing at Peter because he's messing around with these Gentiles. They're unclean. They're common. Now watch verse 18. When they heard these things, that is, that Cornelius had received the Holy Spirit in the baptismal manifestation, they held their peace. That is, they quit fussing at Peter and they glorified God saying, now what did they say? And here's the reason, and the only reason the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. That's the only reason that the baptism of the Holy Spirit took place at the household of Cornelius. Now, if, if, my point is this. If he was saved by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why send for Peter? Don't need him. You see all of that? That's pretty simple to understand. Now, get down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> why send for Peter? Why send for him? Well, first of all, in Acts eleven fourteen, who shall tell thee words? Watch it whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. That's why they sent for Peter. So he could hear words. Words. Words are important. They matter. They mean something. And the apostle Peter preaches a sermon to Cornelius and his household. It begins in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Look at it. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God is impartial. He doesn't think something of one person above another. We're all alike. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That's what he's preaching. This is the sermon. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace, by Jesus Christ that he is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4, there's one Lord. That's Christ. That word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee at the baptism which John preached. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. He's not a Nazarene. He lived in Nazareth. That's what he's called a Nazarene. He lived there. At how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good. There's that statement again I mentioned earlier. How the Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. We're all witnesses of these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. They crucified by Lord pierced his side from which flowed blood and water. John 19, 33, 34. Watch verse 40. Here's the sermon. Continues. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Jesus went to the Hadean world and was after three days and three nights and burst forth victorious from the grave. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, the apostles, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Jesus alive again. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him should receive remission of sins. That's a sermon. One very long. It's to the point. And the sermon was this that Jesus Christ lived, died, 
had been crucified by the hands of men, buried, arose from the dead, and ascended on high. That's the gospel. That's what convicted men of they need to do something about their lives because the fact that Jesus lived and died for them. Now, that's the sermon. That's why they sent for Peter. So I can hear the gospel. Why hear the gospel? Well, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by, you know the rest of that? The word of God. That's why he sent for him. That's 11, Acts 11, 14, and Romans 10, 17. On the day of Pentecost, that sermon began, ye men of Israel, hear these words. So the first thing we have to do in order to be saved is to hear. Hear what? These words. The gospel. Why the gospel? Paul said in Romans 1 16, it's God's power to save and it contains God's righteousness. You know what God's righteousness is? The psalmist defined God's righteousness in Psalm 119, 172 when he said, all of his commandments is his righteousness. That's a definition of God's righteousness. And Paul said in Romans 1, 17, God's righteousness is in the gospel. That's when Cornelius had to hear it. That's when they sent for Peter. So Cornelius and his family could hear the gospel. Men are saved by gospel preaching. Also, why sent for Peter? Because obedience is necessary. God has always expected people to listen to his word, believe his word, and obey it. The Bible's filled with scripture after scripture that tells us that. Like Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, he that what? Doeth the will of my Father, which is got to do. Can't just believe it, you got to do it. In Luke 6, 46, the Lord said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not, do not what? The things that I say. We have to learn to be doers. You know, James in James 1 talked about being a doer. He talked about a man looking in the mirror, remember? He saw himself, forgot what he saw. Got to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. You can sit here all day and not do it. That won't work, will it? Got to hear and got to do. In the final book, in the book of Revelation 22, 14. Blessed, that means happy. Happy are they that do his commandments. Are you happy? Have you done his commandments? That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. That's why they sent for Peter. Because obedience was necessary. And he had to tell him what to do. Also, I said for Peter, people had to repent. Repent or perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Acts 17, 30, God commands all men everywhere to do what? Repent. Repent or perish, remember that? Acts 2, 38, on Pentecost, when people ask, as believers, what must I do? Do? Yeah, there's something to do, right? What they told to do? Repent and that all repent and what? Be baptized. What for? Remission of their sins. That's why I sent for Peter. So I could tell them what to do to be saved from their sins. Repentance is a change of your mind that results in a change of your life. If you're going that way, you turn go that way when you repent. You quit all that meanness and begin doing what's right. Very simple can't just change your mind. God change your life or it won't work. Well, I said for Peter, the man needed to be baptized. Baptized? Yeah. In fact, in Acts 10 and verse 47, after they'd heard the word, they asked this question. Acts 10, 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we. And verse 48 is the kicker. 
What's the kicker? <laughs> it's a command. And he commanded them, commanded them to do what? To be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Baptism is a command. In the name of the Lord. That means by his authority. Remember the Great Commission. He said, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name that is by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's when Peter on Pentecost said, repent and be baptized. What for? The remission of sins. We're often told today that you're saved before you're baptized. That's not what that scripture says, is it? That's what baptism is for. That your sins might be remitted. Remember Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul? He had heard the word. He believed it. And the Lord sent Ananias to him and he said, Why tamarest thou? What are you waiting for? You know, some people keep waiting and waiting and waiting. Sometimes you wait too late. Why tamarest thou? Rise. And do what? Be baptized. What for? To wash away your sins. That's what baptism is for. It washes away your past sins. Makes you clean and pure. Baptism is a burial. It's not a sprinkling or pouring. In Romans 6, 3, and 5, 3 to 5. Buried with Christ. What do you do when you bury something? You immerse it, don't you? In verse 5, he said, it's a planting. When you plant something, you immerse it in the ground, right? Colossians 2, 12. Buried with Christ. Rising to walk in a new life. That's why they sent for Peter. So the man could hear the word, believe it, and obey it, be saved from his sins, and have the right to go to heaven when he dies. What does the Lord do with people when they're baptized? Forgives their past sins. How many of them? Every one of them. If you're honest and sincere about it, you've got to be that. And then he adds you automatically to his church. I often say, that's Acts 2.47, by the way. The Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. I often say, and I say it again, when you obey the gospel, when you're baptized for the remission of your sins, the Lord adds you to his church before you have time to join anything. You can't join the church of Christ. Other than the fact that you join yourself to a local body to work and worship, like Saul did. See how that works? You see why they sent for Peter? A lot of reasons why they need to send for him. But very basically, so he hear the word, so he could obey it. And that's what this lesson's about. Thanks for listening so well. But should you be in this audience now, you've never become a Christian. You've never been baptized. We wouldn't want to close this service without giving you an opportunity to do just that. You've heard the word tonight. Do you believe it? Do you really? Would you turn from your sins and repentance? That's essential. Would you be willing to make that good confession that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You ready then to be baptized? Everything's ready for that, right? Daniel's here to help you make that good confession. What will you say when you confess? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. Baptism of burial, remember. When you come up out of that water, that's called a new birth. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus about it in John 3. Born again of incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God. Maybe you've already obeyed the gospel, been baptized. But you've fallen away. You've been unfaithful. And you want to come back to straighten up things. You can do that by repentance, confession unto God in prayer. Like Simon in Acts 8, 22. And John said in 1 John, If we confess our sins, he's just forgiven. We sing the song. Right now. What'd you come?